so welcome to and thanks for coming to this session about podcast mentoring um it's just uh allison emer and myself who will be presenting i'm gesturing to where she is on my screen which is i'm sorry <laughs> not where she is on your screen um and we're just going to open up basically by talking each of us about our own experiences of mentoring in various capacities including in terms of podcasts and then what I would like to do with the bulk of our time or the, the at least the second half of our time is talk about what podcast mentoring could look like and if we think that the HPN is a good place to maybe do uh, or set up or or facilitate mentoring and what that could look like and what what issues or concerns there are and I definitely like to hear from other people about what they'd either have as an experience of podcast mentoring or what they would like to see or what if, if they were to be involved in something like that what what they'd want to be involved with uh, so I will first though turn it to Allison to start thank you well let's admit this person here we go <laughs> I'll take care of that while you <laughs> oh okay thank you um so welcome everyone my name is Allison Amer and I'm going to just describe for you the experience um, from the perspective of the mentee, the beneficiary of a mentorship arrangement in podcast development. Now, I did make some notes, so you are going to see my eyes revert to my notes because I um, have some things that I really wanted to make sure that I got to. So um, I've uh, just got some notes here on my screen. So I wanted to just start by saying that my situation was rather unique and that I was part of a very highly structured but paradoxically very flexible mentorship relationship that was offered by a fellow academic in exactly the same field. And it's someone who may be known to, to some or all of you, Dr. Sadie Ryan, who's a sociolinguist at the University of Glasgow. And she hosts a podcast called Accentricity, which deals with accents, migration and identity, which is um, exactly my field. I'm a sociolinguist. I neglected to say that at the beginning uh, in Ontario, Canada. So I had begun listening to Sadie's um, podcast while I was looking for resources to use to supplement um, readings for an undergraduate course I was teaching um, pre-service uh, language teachers. And when I stumbled on her podcast, I thought I'd gone to heaven because it was just contained so much content that was relevant to, to the course. Um, and I noticed on her website that she was offering um, mentorship to um, applicants, successful applicants who um, applied to her moving project. And the moving project, I think there's actually um, at least the hashtag, if, if not um, an actual account on Twitter. Um, and it was a project that she developed dealing with migration and language. So she asked her interested listeners to submit a proposal and, and she would go through the proposals and um, and choose those who would be lucky enough to receive her free of charge mentorship, podcast mentorship uh, program. So in actuality, I don't think she turned any of us away. <laughs> I think she probably mentored all of us because it was such a large number that she split us into three different groups and did them um, successively. So I agreed to be in the third um, group. So I was part of it the third time she uh, ran through the, the program. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how she structured her mentorship program, which um, lined up with the way that I learn uh, in an absolutely beautiful way. It was just such a perfect fit. She had YouTube videos, kind of a flipped classroom thing. She had YouTube videos explaining the assignments. Um, she had both YouTube videos and audio tracks of sample assignments that either she or uh, her partner, John McDermott, would do. And uh, John was also um, 
more peripherally um, involved, but he was definitely involved uh, in this project. Um, so uh, she would send an email and the email would introduce the upcoming assignment, provide all the links. Um, she would make recommendations in terms of uh, technical um, requirements and provide links to um, sort of a, a bags of tricks with respect to recording uh, and editing, but then also these kind of exemplar assignments that that either she or her partner did, which was very, very useful. I'm not sure that um, everyone was as much a beginner uh, as I was. And we, the various people that she mentored, we did not meet each other. She corresponded with us um, as uh, individually and met with us online to uh, provide a highly individualized um, response to, to our assignments, extremely well organized. She had a, um, an electronic calendar that allowed us to take into account time differences because we were from all over the world. Um, and from what she shared with us, it was uh, literally everything from Indigenous language learners, people who had lost a language and were um, struggling to um, to revive it, um, at, to um, mixed uh, mixed culture, mixed language families, um, and from from every corner of the of the earth, um, based on on her description in her various emails. Um, so. Um, what I really liked and why I say it felt like a, a university course is that her assignments built on each other. So there was an initial assignment. Uh, thank you so much, Avon, for putting that. So sorry, I've lost my notes. Let me just bring them back. So the the various assignments built on each other. The initial assignment was to uh, develop a trailer, a kind of a teaser for our uh, the the podcast of our dreams, the podcast that we really hoped to be able to 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 launch. And and I found that that was a really really useful assignment because it it. It was a really kind of clever hook. It required us to develop a little bit of technical skills like, uh, you know, recording and editing and splicing. Um, but it also required us to commit to a topic and to have a, a vision that we were going to work with um, going forward. So I'm going to ask um, Milan if you would just play my trailer. I want you to hear. So this is the very first assignment, it was a two minute trailer um, and um, and we used this to build on all of, to create the uh, rest of the assignments going forward. So this is me going from zero editing, zero, I've never used an audio, um, uh, uh, um, an audio editing system software before ever. So I'll just let you have a look so you can hear what a real beginner sounds like. Can you play that, Milan? Hi, I'm Alison Amer. And I didn't hear it either. I thought it was just me. Living multilingually. I'm a wife, mother, grandmother, and professor of sociolinguistics. So my multilingual family is both personal and professional for me. In my podcast, you'll get to meet me, an Anglophone raised in a Francophone part of Ontario, Canada, who is currently married to a German-speaking man, but I used to be married to a Chinese-speaking man from Hong Kong, with whom I have a daughter who's married to a Spanish-speaking man from Mexico, with whom she has a young son who uses Augmentative and Alternative Communication, AAC for short. Confused? 
that's okay. We all live under one roof and you'll get to meet all of us and learn about how we use English, French, Chinese, Spanish, German, and AAC in our daily lives. Want to sneak a peek into our linguistic landscape? You'll hear me speaking Chinese to my dog, the only language that soothes his anxiety about being separated from me overnight. <laughs> And my son-in-law reading a book to my grandson in Spanish. Los dientes nuevos son más grandes. Se ajustan a mi cara a medida que va creciendo. And now my favorite. Here's my grandson using his head to push a switch to make a video that has stopped playing, start playing again. Oh, it stopped. Can you make it go again? Good job. Good job. You're not going to want to miss getting to know this cast of characters as we discuss code switching, identity, accents, disability, and belonging. Thanks very much, Milan. Um, so it really helped for me that the theme of um, Sadie's mentorship program was on language because that fits very much with my own life experience, my own professional education. But uh, I want to say anyone from any discipline or background would benefit equally because her um, enthusiasm and inspiring and so uh, what I wanted to just say on a personal level I think um, to be sure one has to be somewhat in awe of their mentor for the relationship to work I, I had listened to Sadie's podcast um, and I knew that to learn from her would be a great privilege indeed I was in awe of her technical skill and her knowledge but also in awe of her willingness to take on this additional workload of listening to um, to uh, individuals uh, assignments providing this really really tailored customized response and, and I mean tailored she would say you know at minute 3.45 seconds I can hear a cough um, and so she would point out those that level of detail, which I was in awe of for uh, someone who was early in her career uh, to be willing to take on additional work. Just uh, I found just staggering. She pointed out things that I had not considered. Um, so I thought I was very clever, for example, to to add the sound of coffee pouring while I was having coffee with my Indian neighbor discussing the various. Indian languages that she speaks in her home, but there was music playing in the background while I interviewed her, but there wasn't the same music or any music playing when I added the coffee pouring sound. So these are things that, that for people with experience, uh, those are no brainers. That, that, that hadn't occurred to me at all, just in my zeal to show that I could add in the, the pouring coffee sound to create the ambience. I completely missed um, that detail. So she was extremely gracious in providing um, her feedback, but also extremely attentive to detail. And that was really uh, very, very useful for me. Um, her style of mentoring was absolutely perfect. It provided this sort of structure that forced me to uh, commit and engage, but it still left room for this to feel like something fun that I was doing for me and not just more to-do list, busy work um, kinds of things. Uh, so it it really felt like a uh, a personal and creative project. And because I'm an academic, approaching it as a course with assignments worked um, beautifully. So I think I'll just um, I'll pause there.
And um, I'm not sure, Avon, what have we said? Do, will I take questions now or we'll, we'll do no, it all at the end? Let's leave that for the end. Yep. Um, so uh, so I'll take, thank you very much. And I, I, uh, I really like that trailer too. I think it's great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's very cute. Um, but, <coughs> oh, excuse me, it's a good thing about uh, virtual podcast. I have a slight cold, but I don't feel guilty for being around you all <laughs> with such things. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about my own experiences of mentoring. So first of all, I uh, am also or was also an academic. Uh, I taught uh, classics in Canada. This was not an intentionally all Canadian panel, but it has turned into an, an all Ontario panel. And um, I and my husband have had a podcast called The Endless Knot since 2015. Uh, it started, grew out of a, a YouTube channel, actually, originally. It also happens to be on language. Also a coincidence, that, <laughs> that connection. Um, we, that was not intentional either. But uh, ours is on language and etymology and history. And in fact, I know Sadie through the linguistics podcasting, um, again, coincidentally. I have not been involved in any formal podcast mentoring. I have been involved in a uh, more formal, though not as extensive as what Alison was talking about, but more formal mentoring situation um, in my other academic career, that is in, in classics. And I'll speak to that in a moment, but I will talk a little bit about my experience of sort of informal more mentoring with other podcasters. So we're, my husband and I's podcast is very much an independent podcast. While we are academics, there's no university involvement. This is a, a separate project. And we made contact through, in fact, a couple of educational podcast conferences and also through Twitter and just conversations with other podcasters who were in similar situations, who are independent, small. Um, their podcast may have become big, but they're not, not part of larger um, institutions or organizations. And especially in meeting a few of them in person in 2018 and 2019, we found that just being able to in, informally exchange sort of, do you have this problem and what have you done about it come kind of conversations uh, made a huge difference to how sort of manageable doing this whole big project yourself feels because we don't have, it's just the two of us, we don't have any other team and we don't have anyone else to talk to about podcasting. And knowing how much that had helped me just to have some of those conversations early on, I have made it sort of an intentional aspect of my engagement with other podcasters to, not that I have any amazing wisdom particularly to pass on, but simply just having another person who has also had some of the same issues uh, to, you know, to reach out to people. We have worked on trying to provide a few forums for that. Some of them have worked better than others. Uh, just to have conversations with people and to be like, do you have a particular frustration? Feel free to tell me about it and I may have no solution whatsoever, but I'm happy to listen to it and complain with you about it. And so that kind of informal mentoring has been very important to me. Uh, it's more, I mean, at that level, it's more community. I wouldn't say there's a very clear hierarchy as to who's more experienced or less experienced because we're all coming from slightly different perspectives um, in terms of how often we do it or how professional or how much of our, our our life, the podcast happens to be. Another experience is somewhat similar, but a little more formalized is in the YouTube space, which my husband and I started in, uh, we did join a creators group that it basically is just a, a Slack that we are all are, are part of, which is a bunch of educational YouTube creators. And there again, the same sort of thing of being able to ask tech questions and, um, you know, it has never occurred to me whether or not I should ask my guests to fill a, to sign a release form when I interview them. Should I or should I not? And then people chime in, well, I do or I don't, or I'm actually a lawyer and here's my thoughts about it or whatever. And that kind of um, communal sharing of information has been so important to us. And that's what we were looking for with, with podcasting as well. And we've kind of worked towards. So my desire to kind of establish some sort of or find ways to do that kind of mentoring comes out of my experience of feeling that this kind of production is very solo. It's very 
it can be very isolating. It can feel very much like you are, and I, this came up in an earlier conversation in another session, you know, like you're reinventing the wheel with everything that you're doing because yes, you can go and find the websites that tell you a lot of the technical stuff, but maybe it's not focused on, as you say, Alison, like your own particular area or your own particular field, or maybe you're, you're trying to do something that you can't find another podcast that does exactly that to learn from. So my experience of more formal mentoring is not as it's extensive as what uh, Sadie was doing, but in my classics context, there was um, the women's network of the classics, women's classical caucus of in of, of my field, did a, a mentorship program where they simply filled out a Google form and said whether you were looking for a mentor or whether you were willing to be a mentor, what your basic areas of interest were, what your sort of concerns were like do you want mentoring for jobs and promotion or for your research or for teaching or for you know what kinds of or you know navigating the world as a woman in academia or uh balancing family and you know whatever your concerns are put those in and then they matched people up and they just sort of sent an email out saying okay here's <laughs> here you are here's your pair um, you go from here, you make, you get in touch with one another. There was no guidelines as to what that mentorship relationship should look like. It was left very much up to the people. And I was paired with a mentor, um, actually early in the summer of 2019. Uh, so I started, we just started having these zoom chats. That's how it started. And, you know, I got help, help on, uh, I was going up for promotion. She helped me put with my looking over my promotion materials. Uh, she, we, we started meeting on a semi-regular basis to sort of, where are you on your writing and what's, what, what, do, what journal do you want to submit your articles to, that kind of stuff. And I was not early career by that point. I was reasonably mid-career. I'd been working for 13 years or something uh, as a professor, but there's always more to know. And there's always another stage and another step. And, and just having somebody else who can um, give you a little experience was really helpful. So when I think about what could the Humanities Podcast Network possibly do in terms of uh, mentoring, that's a little bit of the model I was thinking about, not something as extensive as what Sadie did, because I'm not sure how many people we have who have that kind of, um, as Allison said, that kind of time and energy to put into it. But I wondered if, and this is where I'd like to sort of stop the presentation part and open this up to a conversation with other people. Is there um, an appetite? Do, do any of the people who are at this session um, think that that would be something that they might find interesting? Would they be willing to be a mentor or be interested in having a mentor? Does it sound like a program that, uh, oh, oh, what, what would we like that to look like? Um, the title of the session was, what could podcast mentoring look like? And I, I, I have some ideas myself, as I've, I've shared, but I would like to know what other people think it might or could be or what you'd like it to be. So why don't I ask um, if you want to, if people want to unmute and turn on their cameras or not, as they wish, I would be very interested to hear from others about, um, or if you have any questions for Allison about Sadie's program or for me about anything else, um, what, what could podcast mentoring look like? And I don't know if you can unmute yourselves, but if you can't put up a, a hand or whatever, and I will unmute you. Not sure what the permissions are. I'm unmuted, I think now, correct? Yeah, you are correct. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the the interesting, one of the reasons I think mentorship of, of this type would be really good is because so much of what you see kind of out online in terms of how to do a podcast and how to make a successful podcast is so focused around monetization and financial uh. growth, right? And I think that the goals of educational podcasts can certainly be that, but it might not be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think there's kind of a different types of questions that sometimes come up or a different different solutions to problems that aren't totally focused on you know, how much revenue you're going to generate a year from now <laughs> based on the content that you're making. So I think it would be good. I think that, I think one of the challenges would be around matching sort of the desired outcome of the people to the 
sort of capabilities and strengths of the of the people providing the mentorship. And um, but I think I think that's probably a, a solvable problem if both sides go in very clear on what the other knows or wants to learn. I think you know good information sharing uh, beforehand can really help with that. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly interested in the topic for sure. I think I think it could it could really help some people cross the the gap of what am I doing? Don't know what I'm doing. I'll just quit now to continuing on with their efforts. The, the point about the fin the monetization being the main goal, I yeah, I echo that for sure. Um, e even whether it's monetization or growing an audience, neither of which I'm you know against, <laughs> not against growing an audience, but e even when I went to the educational podcasts, uh, conferences that I went to, not all of it, but there was, you know, there was a, from a certain segments of the, of the podcasting world, there was a very heavy influence on, okay, how do you make a podcast that your audience wants to listen to? And of mm -hmm. course, that's a completely reasonable question to ask, but it's not actually really is the fundamental question I want to ask. I want to make a podcast that I want to listen to. And I want to make a podcast that I am proud of making that I think does certain things. Now, I also want people to listen to it because otherwise there's no point in making a podcast. But like, that's my main goal. And so listening to people talking about or teaching about, you know, okay, well, just change your podcast, you know, find out what your audience wants and then make your podcast in a way that matches what they want is actually not what I, it's not what I'm looking for. I, I don't want to, frankly, I don't want to change certain core things about my podcast because that's what's important to me about why I'm doing the podcast in the first place. And I think other education, I mean, I'm seeing nods. I think other educational creators are going to kind of resonate with that to some degree more than maybe other groups would be. And so that would be the kind of, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a bit more about what you said, but like, I think that's, that touches on something very much that I felt as a frustration when I, when I look at the larger podcasting competition. Sure. Can I add Even, to that? Oh. Sorry, Milan, I'm just going to interrupt for one moment. There was a third person on our panel who has just um, texted me. And so I think her time difference, she was off by an hour. Oh, no. So, oh, I, no. so I'm just going to mute my microphone and go and get her and, and then right. um, she can join us. So I just sorry to interrupt back to you, Milan. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm glad that she can join. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I wanted to kind of, um, yeah, agree with what's been said so far and to say, you know, yes, I would love to be part of mm -hmm. some kind of mentoring program, either as a mentor as, or as a mentee or both. Um, and I wanted to just share my two experiences of podcast mentoring, just because I think they're a bit different from what's been mentioned mm -hmm. so far. But one in particular really resonates with what you were just saying, Avon. So the first kind of mentorship that I've been involved with is, so I have a podcast called How to Read, which has been going since 2017. And so I just finished a PhD, but throughout the whole of this process, um, since How to Read began, I've been a PhD student and we've worked with undergrads um we've brought on undergrad producers um for like a year at a time um so there's they've kind of cycled through we've had something like seven or eight at this point and so you know they've been working on my podcast um uh but you know they come in um typically with no previous podcasting experience and so you know it is valuable for me as well but I do also view it very much as a mentoring relationship where you know teaching them you know specific kind of technical skills but also really the kind of like conceptual skills um and um you know equipping them to in the future work on other podcasts create their own um anyway I can talk more about that if that's interesting but that's so you know I think sometimes we think about sort of working with undergrads as being this just kind of like teaching relationship, but I think it can very much also be a mentoring one. Um, and then the second one, which which I was thinking about um, with what you were saying, Avon, and also Wesley. Um, so I, I had a public humanities fellowship a few years ago. So that was not uh, exclusively about podcasting, although I came in with a podcast related project and the coordinator of that, um, 
was, um, you know, uh, someone whose background was in architecture and who had not even really listened to podcasts before, but some of her kind of input on my work was really amazing in part because she would say things um, like, you know, to, to, to really push me to rethink what I was thinking about when I was thinking that this podcast was reaching the public. And her point was like, there is no such thing as the public. There are many publics and, you know, you create something that is targeted towards specific publics and maybe even creates a public. And in particular, that really was very liberating to me because it helped me to realize that there's a real value in creating a podcast that is not for everyone, but that is for a very specific community with specific interests and, you know, concerns and tastes and so on. And so to go with what Avon was saying about, you know, there are some things that, you know, you don't want to change just to get a bigger listenership. And so I do think there's something about, you know, it can be valuable to be mentored by someone who has actually no relationship to podcasting, but who has that kind of like, um, sort of uh uh what's the word like just that sort of conceptual thinking about like what is a public what is you know public humanities work um anyway so I'm going to stop there but um I'm loving this conversation yeah thank you Milan I think all that's very useful and I I want to come back to the student bit in a bit and uh Kim also had a question about that um Allison there's a question also about Sadie's project and your project about language and migration in the chat. If you feel like answering it in the chat, you could also answer it later, but just uh, sure. Just thank you. I'll go back, go back and look. Back. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'd like to welcome our third member of the panel, Ali, who is neither Canadian nor a linguistics podcaster, but does share a name with Allison. So, you know, we're, we're finding all of our commonalities. <laughs> um, so what I'll do, Ali, why don't we just let you launch into to what you wanted to share and then we'll return to a uh, question and answer so that sounds good and first let me just like apologize so much for messing up the time zones I, I really do appreciate all of you being here and I'm sorry that I that I was not um yeah so um I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan and I study history and my research focuses on the history of incarceration um childhood and youth um and legal history um but I also last year was the yeah time suck right. Um, I also last year was the um, the um, season producer for the University of Michigan Department of History's podcast, which is Reverb Effect. Um, and for anybody that has been in graduate school, you you know that um, these things often sort of transition. So it was a GSRA, which means it was a one year appointment. So I'm no longer doing that. But I did learn quite a bit from my time there. Um, and if it's cool with you all, I'd love to share just a little bit about um, mentorship um, that I sort of feel is important and that I, I, I learned during my time there. Um, let me just pull up the right tab now. So here we go. Okay. Um, so a little over a month ago, uh, news broke that the Maryland Attorney General joined Adnan Saeed's family in a motion to vacate that case. Um, if you aren't familiar with the case, which has been documented for public audiences in various formats, I would recommend giving Undisclosed Podcast a good old listen. Um, my partner and I had a road trip coming up and we'd followed the case. So we decided to give a different podcast, Serial, a listen. Um, and Serial is often credited for bringing the case into the limelight. Um, to be honest, it hit very differently on re-listen. Um, I had originally listened to it in 2018, which is right before I started graduate school. And I remember thinking at the time just how irresponsible the prosecutors were, um, but being drawn into the like true crime and did he or didn't he aspects of it. Um, on re-listen, it felt really different. Um, it was hard to give, or it was hard to ignore rather Sarah Koenig's role in downplaying the racism um, of the criminal legal system and the role of the cops. Um, and it felt really uncomfortable to me that Rabia Chaudhry, who is a friend and ceaseless advocate of Said, um, and who originally brought the case to Koenig, was at best a side character. Um, and the schadenfreude, of course, of the did he or didn't he felt irresponsible and shameful. Um, this is a real person's life and the case shook a whole community. The whole podcast felt off. 
So this pattern continued, I found, and maybe even got worse in the new episodes following developments in his case, um, especially the fact that Serial never really copped to where they messed things up, like misrepresenting cell phone data or trusting the cops, who, according to a September Baltimore Sun article, had a history with misconduct and wrongful conviction cases. Um, this is far from a unique take. Chaudhry herself has been really vocal about Serial's flaws. Um, okay, so why am I talking about a podcast that I had like literally nothing to do with? Um, to briefly introduce myself, as I already done, I'm the season. I was the season producer for season three of Reverb Effect, um, which is the University of Michigan Department of History's podcast. Um, there's only a few episodes though, so using specific specific examples, even with without names just isn't anonymous. Um, so for me, I think mentorship is about maintaining trust even after the fact. And I didn't feel it would be right to get into the specifics, positive or negative, uh, about people who have trusted me with their scholarship. And really what I'm going to talk about um, is partnerships and objectivity in the context of how we do mentorship. Um, Reverb Effect is pretty unique, I think. It's a grad student uh, run podcast. And let me just also say that I'm really sorry again that I'm late and that if I'm going to double cover anything anybody has already talked about. Um, but Reverb Effect is um, grad student run and it's important to the project because it's a way to build new kinds of professionalization into the graduate student experience. In practice, what that looks like is having two producers. Um, the season producer who does the digital production, the project management and the script editing and uh, mentoring. And then there's the episode producer. And the episode producer is another historian, most often a graduate student, though we do have some really excellent episodes that were produced by faculty. Um, the episode producer translates their work for the podcast format. And this is where trust comes in. So in terms of editing, is there anything more frightening for an aspiring academic than to give their work to somebody that they don't know all that well and to trust them to give thoughtful, honest, kind feedback that actually helps their work? Um, and of course, the trust that that editor won't talk negatively about work to colleagues. Um, and on top of that, episode producers need to trust the season producer to put the podcast together in a way that's actually reflective of their work and that makes sense for their audience and that feels right to the episode producer. But does the season producer doing all of that sound editing set up unequal power dynamics due to the opacity of like the tech stuff, right? So it's easy to abuse a line like we can't do this request because it won't sound good. Um, so doing a podcast and I think doing podcast mentorship is about building trust and then being trustworthy. Um, and I'm using Serial as an example where that didn't happen. Um, Chaudhry trusted Koenig with a friend who might as well be family's case, and she just didn't really live up to that trust. With the episode by episode format, as opposed to a well-researched arc, she kind of ended up making some judgmental statements that turned out to be wrong. And even in the newer episodes, there was never just like a simple, yeah, you know, we got that wrong. So then part of mentorship is guiding mentees to formats and to methods of storytelling that yes, work for the audience, but more importantly, work for the communities that we're partnering with. So to that end, I think that the problems in Serial were foundation deep. It was a lack of partnership for me. So in Reverb Effect, we partner with experts and the, those are the episode producers. And we really let them take the lead in their historical analysis. So we'll edit and we'll provide guidance on how to transform academic work to public scholarship work, but we really try to stay, take a step back in the actual craft of history. Um, now I am not claiming that the podcast that I produced was the gold standard that everybody should follow all the time. Um, and in fact, the podcast has had some real issues with um, overrepresentativeness, uh, over overrepresentation, excuse me, of white historians, which I'll add is also, you know, mirrored on this panel, um, and of scholars of 20th century United States history. So one of the steps that we're working on to change that is offering different paths of participation, um, some with a lower time uh, commitment um, on the episode producer's part, um, and we're experimenting with different episode formats as well, which we hope will more thoughtfully engage um, our community of experts. So, but the actual sell though, of like 
why podcasting has been a pretty easy conversation with the community. So podcasting provides us with a unique opportunity to flip scholarship to be meaningful to a bigger audience than the seven people who are going to read our dissertations. Podcasting forces the author or speaker to represent their work in a different context. So with a mentor providing thoughtful editing and good questions, this can help authors explore new avenues of analysis or see different questions that need answering. And perhaps somewhat uncomfortably, podcasting absolutely blows up the idea that historians should be distant from their subjects or objective. Um, which isn't actually a thing because everyone, every story, every piece of evidence has a perspective. Um, so podcasting to me anyways, isn't breaking the fourth wall. It's leveling with the audience. We don't sacrifice content to convey it, but the mechanisms of delivery does um, do force us to engage with the audience rather than forcing the audience to engage with us. When we podcast, we can't hide behind jargon or gesture at theory that we think folks should understand implicitly. When all that's stripped down, all that's left is your work. And that's where trust comes back in because you need a mentor who you trust enough to tell you, you know, I'm not really convinced yet. Or I wonder if you're missing some perspectives here, whose voices are missing. And that's our job with kindness, of course. And I think partnership and mentorship were an area of opportunity for Serial and for Koenig. I think all of us sometimes need to be reminded to let the sources guide uh, the questions and answers rather than going in with our own set of questions written in stone um, and hoping for a specific answer. Um, Koenig was an outsider to the community and was kind of stuck in this like, did he or didn't he dichotomy? Um, and perhaps a criticism of what I'm going to say here is that engaging with communities destroys objectivity. But as I've already said, I think objectivity is a purely theoretical goal in the humanities that can erase authorial positionality and whitewash history. Without partnership, um, Koenig, I think, missed a real opportunity um, for a more robust set of questions about equity and justice and in law. Um, and maybe that's a different podcast. But maybe it's a podcast that would have treated Saeed more like a partner rather than a subject. Um, and Koenig's a journalist, not a lawyer. So perhaps recognizing then where our expertise is and where it isn't is a crucial part of providing good mentorship. Because as mentors, it's good to guide mentees to not only seek help, but to meaningfully partner with people who really truly know what they're talking about. Um, and the line, I think, is nothing about us without us that should apply to public scholarship and especially podcasting as it does activist work. And as mentors, I think it's a really good idea not to, mis not to misrepresent where our expertise is and, and we can and we should seek help as well. So that's what I had to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ali. I really appreciate all of that. And I'm really glad you were able to join us to, <laughs> to, to put that into the conversation. Uh, thanks, Ayani. Um, I think that last point you talked about expertise, um, I want to maybe pick up on that to go back to what Milan was talking about, about having undergrad students that could be podcast meant, you know, that are mentees. And what Kim asked, what's the line between an internship and a mentorship, or I could also say between mentorship and teaching. I mean, Alison, what Sadie was doing, she puts under the rubric of mentorship, but um, you know, one could very easily package that and call it a podcasting course, right? Like that's also basically what, what she was doing was teaching you Absolutely. a podcasting course. Um, and obviously I think this is a continuum of things, but um, you know, maybe, well, does anyone else have any thoughts about where, um, where that like line of expert, like is mentorship between an expert and a beginner is mentorship between uh peer, can you can you have peer mentorship um and what does that look like what what level of expertise does one do we not just one not just theoretically but like do we as a group maybe think is appropriate for you know if we're going to ask people to be mentors within the hpn say what like what level of expertise does one have to have to feel like one could be the mentor rather than mentee can you be both uh, I put those questions on the floor. 
I have some thoughts, but I'll just hold back and and um, and and let other people jump in first. <laughs> Nobody else is going to talk. I will absolutely talk. Yeah, go. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> no, go, go, go. I was just be saying go. <laughs> Sorry, five year old came in the room. Um, <laughs> so I, I was going to say, like, I think that. I think within the mentor mentee relationship, there is some kind of assumed knowledge gap there, right? Knowledge and experience gap, but a mentee mentor, I don't feel like has to be a complete expert on everything. I think that just having somebody who has done some stuff or knows a little bit more than somebody else is enough to form that relationship. And so, you know, you can have somebody who's never done a podcast before ever. And then somebody who is at least, you know, released some episodes, there's still so much that, that can, can be transmitted between those two people in terms of learning that, that I think it can still be useful. Um, and then there, there can be experts out there. Um, but I think that the, definition of a mentor can be very broad and maybe should be broad because if you if you just have it just the most experienced most expert people first of all it's going to be hard, hard to find those people and then also you may sort of filter down to a very specific set of individuals that that may limit the the amount of voices that you have helping people very good points um Either Ali, did you want to jump in now? I'll, with I'll jump in if that's it. okay. Yeah. I think I, I think the idea about um, mul like multiple like um, Milan's thought about um, thinking past the one-on-one -on -one mentorship is really important because I think also the um, the one-on-one -on -one mentor where one person has all the expertise and they're sort of like planting that into the other person can be. Um, kind of like colonial almost. And I think that part of like public history work should be um, like a, decol a decolonizing project and decolonizing knowledge. Um, and so coming that from e equal playing field, I think is really valuable. I don't think we need to think about expertise as um, something that's like static. I think that we should think about it as something that um, evolves and changes and also that like, Maybe it's in one thing and not the other. And I think that good mentorship can come from providing thoughtful editing or asking good questions. You know, like, so I'm a historian, right? And so I do not know anything about um, 18th century France, but I did edit a podcast about 18th century France. Um, and the way you do that is you, you use what you know about historical methods and you use what you know about historical theory and you ask questions that maybe you don't know anything about what they're writing about but you know ideas about how they're thinking about these things and you know the source base that they're working with and the, you know sort of like the theoretical framework that they're working within um so yeah I think I think expertise gets a little tricky when we think about it just simply as like one-on-one, -on -one, especially in sort of like the traditional academic sense of like advisor, advisee, right? I think thinking past that model is really important in public humanities. And it can also be so beneficial just to get different viewpoints, you know, where somebody is a historian and brings that view and somebody maybe, I don't know, has done a baseball podcast. And so they bring a totally different view on what you're doing. And, but they can still provide interesting insight into the, the, the outcome, even if their experience is completely different than what you're going for or what any of the other people that you're discussing it with um, have. I've left my camera off. This is Ali, Ali with a Y talking. <laughs> um, I've left my camera off because I keep getting uh, low bandwidth messages. And so I, I'm hopeful that this will work. Um, so I, for one, really enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship kind of relationship with Sadie. I'm not sure given my um, temperament and um, busy schedule, and I, and I know we're all busy, um, I, I'm not sure I would have stuck around in a kind of a collaborative group learning sort of situation. Um, and um, I just 
I really needed someone who had the answer to all of my questions and could convey it quickly and concisely. Now that's, that again, that's just me and my current uh, life situation. But what I appreciated uh, was being able to say, for example, I don't enjoy editing, Sadie. It, it gives me a knot in my stomach. It's the least interesting part of, of podcasting. I don't get any sense of, I, I know how to do it, but it just feels like busy work. And she said, um, okay, so don't do it. So hire a grad student to do it. And if you don't like the, if you don't like editing, then um, that doesn't mean you can't be a podcaster. And so that was really helpful for me because I um, somehow hadn't realized that. I somehow thought that if I couldn't do my own editing or, or didn't want to do my own editing, then I didn't have um, I didn't have a, I couldn't have a podcast. And so. Um, so given that it's something that I will use in my coursework, I can, in fact, hire a graduate student to do that. And I get to just have the creative, do the creative piece. Um, and so her being, um, I guess, a fellow academic and being able to come up with that suggestion of hiring a grad student to do it was really useful for me. And um, yeah, and, and Wesley, I, I agree uh, with, with your comment about the time and effort efficiency that you get in that one-on-one -on -one scenario. Um, but I certainly also get that great things come out of group situations. But I just wanted to, to throw that out there that I don't think I would have been part of it if it had been a weekly meeting where we all got together and shared our ideas and our skills. Can I just ask what maybe is a cynical question, but what was in it for her? Because, and, and I don't, don't mean that completely cynically, but like, it sounds amazing what you got, but also like, and it, you, you said she was offering it for free. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, that sounds, was it just an extremely generous gift that she was giving you? I, I like, if Milana, we want, I, mm. I asked the same question exactly <laughs> verbatim. Why are you doing this? Are you nuts? Um, and and I think it's a, just a very generous gift. I think it was. I, I don't. I don't know whether it was just a perfect season in her personal and professional life that she had the time to do it, but she was enthusiastic about it and enthusiastic about the topic and and wanted to. Um, inspire us and it was absolutely um it was absolutely a gift maybe she'll write a paper about it um as an academic i'm not sure but yes i was in the right place at the right time to be part of it yeah i guess i'm just wondering like what can we kind of generalize from this amazing thing she did like what are the things that made it worthwhile for her that maybe people that haven't thought about doing it you know would would allow them to do something like that. I, I certainly don't want to speak for Sadie by any means because I can't, but uh, judging from some of the work that came out of that that I think she has shown on her own podcast, so I listened to her podcast, uh, part of it was about the content. That's why it was very specific. She wanted people who were doing particular kinds of content. I think she was partly interested in like expanding the voices very literally of those people who are podcasting, getting more work done on language variation and regional differences and things like that. You know, the, the, so that was part of it. My, what, what I gathered was that it was not just that she wanted to help people with podcasting, but she wanted more podcasts on these particular things to exist in the world. Uh, but I also agree that it was an, an, an immense amount of commitment. And when I talk about wanting to do mentorship with HPN, I will be very clear that that is not the level of commitment that I feel ready to give myself. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, 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 there's somewhere in between there that I think that would, would be valuable. Yeah, um, maybe, I, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say maybe even, I mean, in graduate seminars, right, we have the, um, the roundtable discussion, which is really valuable, I think, because you do get other people's perspectives, which are I think really invaluable, especially as we're all tackling, I think 
increasingly challenging issues in a world that's increasingly hostile to humanities. Um, so I think the varied perspectives can be um, just crucial. Um, but then it's combined, right, with office hours. So you can sort of see the faculty one-on-one -on -one and get the more expediency of like, I have this one question, let's hammer it out. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe something that, maybe that, something like that could be an effective middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I put in the chat, you know, maybe something like you do a little workshop on a particular thing that people are interested in, and then you have the one-on-one -on -one follow ups where you have like a, a couple of scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings and with that guide, that mentor, who is will and you know, who is then willing also to give you feedback down the road if you put their work into, into you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, that could be worked out. I don't want to keep people longer, though, because we're at six now. So um, I want to first of all say thank you very, very much to everyone for being here. Uh, I want to point out that Milan has put um, the link to the form in a Google form in the chat. That Put your name down if you want to be on the HPN mailing list. And if you want, if you are interested in a mentorship program from any direction, uh, please, you can fill out that form and just say that in it because it asks what you'd be interested in, in being involved with. Um, and we'll follow up with that. And if we do produce something, if you're on the HPN mailing list, we may well be calling out for anyone who would like to be part of a working group to establish a mentorship program because I don't want to do it by myself, that's for sure. Collaboration. We've we've definitely come down on collaboration is the way to go. <laughs> so thank you again to everyone. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow, I hope, at to the next day. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you, Milan, for your leadership and Avon and Ali. Pleasure to work with you. Same. All right. Have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.